evening, everybody. It's nice to see such a super crowd here tonight. It's a pleasure to welcome you to our program on Thomas Wilford and his remarkable Lumia, which I hope all of you have had a, at least a peek in the gallery to see what these amazing things look like. I'm Virginia Mecklenburg. I'm the chief curator here at the Smithsonian American Art Museum. It's my special pleasure tonight to welcome the ambassador to Denmark, uh, from Denmark to the United States, His Excellently Lars G. Loza and his wife, Mrs. Ulla Romberg. They're, tonight, uh, they're with us tonight as we celebrate a Danish-born artist. We want to thank the ambassador and the embassy for providing invaluable guidance as we were working on this show and support for the exhibition. Wilfred was the consummate experimental artist, but he was also a skilled mechanic and electrician with several patents to his credit. These are two of the patents that Wilfred was awarded. We are very grateful to have collaborated with the United States Patent and Trademark Office to present the show in Washington, and delighted that Elizabeth Doherty and Larry, Larry Terrazano of the Patent and Trademark Office have joined us tonight. Now, I also want to acknowledge really generous funding that was provided by the Elizabeth Brune Curatorial Endowment, which honors our fairly recently retired director, Betsy Brune, the James F. Dickey Family Endowment, and the Scan Design Foundation. Nancy Zinn, I haven't seen you yet. There you are. Nancy, we are so pleased to have you here representing the foundation. Now, the exhibition, Lumia, Thomas Wilford and the Art of Light, was organized by Keeley Orgeman, who you will see momentarily, who is the Alice and Alan Kaplan Assistant Curator of American Painting and Sculpture at Yale University Art Gallery. Dr. Orgeman received her PhD from Boston University, where she was awarded both a presidential fellowship and the coveted Jan and Warren Adelson Fellowship in American Art, and who, I am very proud to say, is actually a SAM alum. She was here as a summer intern years ago, and she said it just really sparked her commitment to go to work in an art museum, so we are very proud of that. Now, Dr. Orgeman's first assignment at Yale was to take a visitor who wanted to look at the Lumia in the collection out to storage. It was the first meeting in what has become a wonderful close re friendship and relationship with Eugene, Carol, and A.J. Epstein. And ultimately, it was the genesis for this, this exhibition. Eugene was a graduate student in radio astronomy at Harvard when he happened into the Museum of Modern Art one day in 1960. He saw his first Lumia there, and it, as he said, it totally blew him away. That first encounter, which is now almost 60 years ago, hard to believe, sparked a lifelong commitment that he shares with his wife, Carol, and his nephew, AJ, who is a light artist also, to collect and preserve the work of a man whose name is no longer familiar, even to scholars of American art who've worked during the first half of the 20th century, including me. I sort of, the name was vaguely familiar. I've done a lot of work on the 40s and 50s, but no images came to mind. But in the 1920s and 30s, Wilford truly was a sensation. He gave recitals all over Europe and the US on his Clavelux. And in the center panel of the clipping on the right, you can see him at the keyboard with that huge screen. So he was projecting his Lumia onto the screen. He was celebrated in Vanity Fair magazine, the New York Times. Scientific American actually did a whole spread on him in 1930, and there were a host of other newspaper and magazine clippings that celebrated Wilfred. Um, and his work was acquired by some of the country's most distinguished and um, collectors and museums. I mean, the Met, the Museum of Modern Art, Cleveland are just a few. But it is the vision of Dr. and Mr. Epstein and Mrs. Epstein and Dr. Orgeman who will bring the works to life for us tonight. Um, it's been a labor of commitment and love to bring these works, many of which had been in storage for close to 30 years, or in some cases longer, uh, bring them back to life to make them run again, to have them operate, and to have them be precisely the compositions that Thomas Wilford intended them to be. Now, if you'll please mute your cell phones. I just remembered to do mine. Um, Keely? Will you join us? Yes. 
Thank you, Virginia, and good evening, everyone. It's been a tremendous pleasure to see the great work that my colleagues at SAM have done in bringing the exhibition to fruition at the museum. And I want to echo Virginia's thanks and add my own personal gratitude to the many people who have contributed to this project, as I know it has been an especially challenging one, and all of you will understand what I mean when I begin to discuss the content of the exhibition in a moment. But the works look absolutely spectacular in these galleries, and it's difficult to imagine a more fed, a fitting venue than this one, considering Sam's exceptional commitment to time-based media in American art. And I encourage all of you to try to attend the upcoming gallery talks associated with the exhibition. Uh, I believe that the first um, will be by Dan Finn, who is Sam's media conservator, and he will be speaking on October 12th and December 15th on his experience of working with these uh, pre-digital technologies in the work of, um, in this exhibition. And the second will be by, on December 5th, by Gregory Zinman, who will be speaking on the ways in which the light art of Thomas Wilfred, who is of course the subject of this exhibition, has permeated the field of later time-based media through video art, popular light shows of the 1960s, and experimental media about which Greg Zinman has written so brilliantly in the exhibition catalog. And I'd like to begin with the catalog, actually, because it provides a useful entry into this material. With 161 color illustrations packed into 172 pages, the book features an artist foreword, four scholarly essays, a plate section, an appendix of selected archival drawings, an exhibition history, and a selected bibliography. And you might be wondering, why are there so many illustrations in this book? Well, this gets at the very nature of the objects themselves, which feature displays of constantly moving light forms that change in palette and pattern as they traverse a flat or curved screen. There are many dozens of images, therefore, that could be photographed of any given light composition by Wilfred and chosen to represent each work in the book. The artist who made these works between 1920, the 1920s and 1960s, Thomas Wilfred, built an international reputa reputation as the pioneer of this new art form, which he called Lumia. That was his term. And he created these works with of multi uh, I'm sorry, kinetic, multicolored abstractions with these silent analog instruments. And again, instruments was his term. Wilfred was among the very first artists to use light as a medium, and he realized a fusion of modern art and pre-digital technology akin to painting with the rays of a light bulb. The catalog also seeks to demonstrate that Lumia resonates with artists and audiences of Wilfred's own time and of later generations. And to this end, the foreword is authored by the contemporary light artist, James Terrell, whose work many of you will know. Um, and here I'm showing an image uh, that was taken from, from one of Terrell's recent installations that is still on view at Mass Mocha in North Adams, Massachusetts. In this brief but fascinating text, Terrell shares an anecdote from his teenage years about visiting the Museum of Modern Art in New York with his aunt, a prominent magazine editor in the city. And she insisted that they go to the museum together so that he could see what she considered an iconic cultural work, which was Monet's Water Lilies. Terrell writes in the catalog, quote, the Monet was impressive, just in its size within the room. A bit out of focus, I thought. But I was dutifully impressed. In a walk through the museum, I encountered a work that I now believe to have been Vertical Sequence Opus 137 by Thomas Wilfred. It stopped me in my tracks, a glowing orb of light slowly rotating and spreading about auroral spectra, arresting for sure, but more than that, this was from our culture, from our time. It connected, 
not a depiction of light, it was light, alive, and not an import from the old world or our interpretation of or reaction to the European tradition of painting. This came from here, where I came from. Little did I know that Mr. Wilfred was actually Richard Edgar Lovstrom, formerly of Denmark, himself an import. The slide on the screen shows two still images from Wilfred's vertical sequence, Opus 136. And this is the prototype for the composition that stopped the teenage Terrell in his tracks at MoMA. The, this work is now owned by Carol and Eugene Epstein, the latter of whom I will introduce to you shortly. Terrell's anecdote offers two important insights to bear in mind about Wilfred. First, of course, that he was an immigrant. Born in Denmark in 1889, Richard Lovstrom relocated to New York in 1916, and after a few years of living in the United States, then adopted a more American-sounding name, perhaps hoping that it might improve the chances of his new art form to take, take root in America. In a later interview asked why he immigrated to the United States, Wilfred replied, quote, I wanted to see if my work would find a better soil here a more open mind. This statement suggests Wilfred's ambivalence towards the traditional media he studied at art schools in Europe, including at the Sorbonne in Paris, which led him to conclude that imitating luminosity on canvas or in marble could never replicate the innate character of light, that is, a force of energy that travels constantly through space. What better place to test this idea, Wilfred thought, than the country in which Thomas Edison first patented the incandescent light bulb, and in which the physicist Albert Einstein was then postulating his groundbreaking theories on the behaviors of light in the universe. The second key point in James Turrell's story about Wilfred is his recognition of something organic in Lumia, as if it were alive. Terrell calls it. Although Wilfred created his light sculptures between a half century to nearly a century ago, they are far more than historical artifacts, even more than abstractions. Rather, in the same way that Terrell has said of his own art that it's not about light, it is light, Lumia are meant to heighten one's awareness of seeing light as a phenomena in itself even if it conjures in your imagination the experience of viewing distant stars through the telescope or the aurora borealis in the night sky, both analogies Wilfred associated with his Lumia. That Wilfred's works are enduring entities, which continue to change in every moment of the present and will change in the future, point to the temporal dimension built into the very design of the art form Lumia, that is, the composition's duration. Wilfred calculated the compositional duration as the length of time it takes the ever-moving forms and colors to repeat an exact combination on the screen. For example, you will not see this exact image in the composition of Study in Depth, Opus 152, dated 1959, for 142 days, two hours, and 10 minutes, or the time uh, uh, the amount of time it takes for the cycles of the various moving parts behind the screen to coincide. In addition to understanding Lumia as these enduring living entities, I relate to Terrell's sense of having discovered a kind of art that connected differently when, viewed, when he viewed Lumia for the first time. In the fall of 2008, after just beginning my new position as a curatorial fellow at the Yale Art Gallery, I was asked by the curators in my department to accompany a visitor to our off-site storage facility, as Virginia just mentioned. And you will hear from this person yourselves momentarily, but to spoil some of the surprise, uh, that visitor was A.J. Epstein, who turned out to be a major collector of Wilfred's work. A.J. had inquired about viewing for the very first time the gallery's three Lumia objects, given to the museum by Wilfred's son, Thomas C. Wilfred, in 1983, along with a trove of the artist's papers to Yale University Library. And when we arrived at our storage facility, we were greeted by three very eager museum staff, 
uh, Chief Curator Ian McClure, the Defu Deputy Chief Conservator Carol Snow, and our Collections Manager Jason DeBlock, who uncrated and set up the three works for us in a small room. And my colleagues admitted to being a bit apprehensive about switching on these electrical machines. After all, none of us knew anything about Wilfred, and all of the objects had old original wiring, which dated as early as 1928, the date of elliptical pre prelude and chalice, which is shown here on the screen. Conservator Carol Snow stood ready with a fire extinguisher. <laughs> I'm not kidding. Um, as one of the others of us flipped the switch on this mechanism, which instantly filled the ceiling with a vortex of colored light, all of our jaws dropped to the floor. We were so immediately taken with Lumia that our team immediately set to work planning an exhibition, and we've uh, and ever since then we've benefited from the Epstein's guidance at every step along the way. Before we begin our conversation with AJ and Eugene Epstein this morning, I'd like to make just a few other points to lay the groundwork. First, it is important to note that the Epsteins have collectively lent seven of the 15 lightworks by Wilfred in this installation. And both Eugene and AJ, who manage two separate but often shared collections, own several more objects than have been selected for inclusion here. I'm showing just one work borrowed from Eugene Epstein's collection, untitled Opus 161, which might be of special interest to any movie buffs in the audience, as footage of this Lumia work was featured as an enigmatic representation of cosmic creation in Terence Malick's 2011 film, The Tree of Life. Loans from the Cleveland Museum of Art, the Jocelyn Museum of Art, the Museum of Modern Art, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, and the Hirshhorn Museum and Sculpture Garden of the Smithsonian Institution, plus the three works from Yale University Art Gallery and a selection of drawings from Wilfred's archive at Yale are also on view in the exhibition. Overall, these 15 Lumia compositions represent just under half of Wilfred's extant functional works. The exhibition features an example of all three types of home use instruments, that is, works intended to be played at home by an individual operator who could change certain aspects of the composition, which Wilfred designed in his early career from the late 1920s to the mid-1930s. The other 12 works are drawn from the subsequent phases of Lumia's development, when Wilfred primarily produced self-contained and self-playing objects. Between 1932 and 1968, Wilfred completed 26 of, of these works, what he called recorded compositions that were fully automatic and non-changeable by the viewer. Another topic of our discussion this evening will be a type of work by Wilfred that sadly could not be included in the exhibition, one dating to the first decade of his career, and, and Virginia touched on this in her opening remarks. In 1919, Wilfred began to build his first model of the clavelux, a silent organ-like instrument used to produce immersive light projections on a cinema-sized screen. Thus, the earliest Lumia compositions were ephemeral performances given by the artist. Oops. Given by the artist himself and viewed by live audiences in concert halls. By the mid-1920s, Wilfred was enjoying the success of his num numerous clavelux performances in Canada, Europe, and all across the United States, one of which was given right here in Washington, D.C. for the American Federation of Arts in 1932. Today, none of the eight clavelux models that were constructed up to 1948 have survived, apart from some disassembled equipment that is currently in the possession of the Epsteins. The claveluxes now exist mostly through documentary photographs found in the Wilfred papers, such as the one seen here and enlarged uh, in the exhibition, and through keyboard notations that Wilfred interpreted like musical scores to conduct the light's rhythm, movement, and color sequences. There are four examples of Wilfred's keyboard notations on view in the exhibition, along with a poster advertisement, which served to represent this largely lost period of the er artist's early practice. 
The third aspect that I'd like to emphasize are the various contexts in which Wilfrid's work was exhibited in its own day. I've already mentioned two, and that's the live Clavelux recitals he was commissioned to perform in various concert halls in the United States and abroad, and the three types of small-scale instruments he designed uh, to be operated by the individual user in the home. But there are two additional types of sites that dramatically broadened Lumia's visibility. In 1934, Wilfred opened the headquarters for an, organi an organization he named the Art Institute of Light in rented spaces in Midtown Manhattan, where he gave Lumia demonstrations, maintained a studio, and played seasonal Clavelux performances until the institute was forced to close its doors after the US entered World War II. During this nine-year period, however, Wilfred was able to gain a very loyal following among such art world luminaries as modern Museum of Modern Art director Alfred Barr Jr. and curator Dorothy Miller, who went on to display three Lumia works at the museum at various times between 1942 and 1980. With MoMA's purchase of vertical sequence op Opus 137, and remember that's the work that Terrell saw, uh, in um, that work dates to 1942, the museum launched Lumia's entry into other public collections and commercial galleries, providing Wilfred with crucial institutional support and with broad audiences. Sorry, I scrambled my papers a little bit here. My final point in concluding these remarks with regards to the Lumia is with regards to the Lumia instrument's basic mechanics. That is, how do these objects work? Uh, using light from an incandescent light bulb as his raw material, which is the case in every single object in the exhibition, Wilfred introduced form, motion, and color into a composition by separately or simultaneously applying a series of mechanical operations inside the instrument. Most of these instruments first transmitted light through a color record, which is a rotating disc with applied color, as pictured here at le left, taken from the example of elliptical prelude and chalice, in which the color records are concealed inside that metal box below the table. In addition to the color element, which always rotates inside the mechanism, sometimes the bulbs themselves rotate on an axis. Forms are then transmitted onto the composition, or I'm sorry, into the composition, when light is bent in all of these various ways, whether refracted through clear lenses or ribbed glass, diffracted around cut sheet metal, or reflected off polished aluminum and concave mirrors. Expanding these ideas in both complexity and scale over the course of his career, Wilfred employed these light bulbs, colored discs or other kinds of colored elements, and also reflective surfaces in multiple different configurations to give rise to the light forms that are ultimately directed onto the screen. I continue to find it remarkable that these same basic electromechanical components, which produced the earliest work in the exhibition, that is elliptical prelude and chalice, were also used in the highly complex work commissioned by the Museum of Modern Art in 1963, titled Lumia Suite, Opus 158. In this later work, recently restored by a conservation team from MoMA and Yale, two moving light bulbs, two rotating color records, 18 sheets of polished aluminum positioned on two rotating tiers, and other moving mirrored surfaces all combine in their various speeds of motion to yield a composition of nearly incalculable duration, meaning that none of us will witness a repetition of form and color combinations on the screen during the entire run of the exhibition. The work will virtually be new every time we come to it. Collectively speaking, the significance of Lumia in the history of early to mid 20th century modern art is still being debated and considered among those interested in the subject, and indeed, one of the aims of the exhibition is to reopen those dialogues. There are unquestionably uh, only a handful, uh, I'm sorry, a handful of individuals who have thus far been responsible for ensuring that Wilfred's work may live in perpetuity 
and it is now my great pleasure to introduce the two most notable of them to you. This entire project would simply not have been possible without the exhibition team's close partnership with this incredibly dedicated, knowledgeable, and generous duo of Lumia collectors, Dr. Eugene E. Epstein and uh, his nephew, Adam A.J. Epstein. Eugene is a retired radio astronomer and A.J. Epstein, a theater owner, producer, Lumia artist, and a founder of the nonprofit organization Clavelux.org in Seattle. Decades ago, they began acquiring Wilfred's artworks, spare mechanical parts, as well as a stock of light bulbs and other materials that Wilfred used, and have made Lumia objects publicly available through loans to both international and domestic exhibitions and other museum installations. Thanks to AJ's trip to New, New Haven in 2008, which shortly thereafter drew Eugene into the fold, the team at Yale came to know them very well and to rely on their guidance, initially for helping us to better understand all of these in intricacies of Wilfred's work, from the mechanisms themselves to Wilfred's philosophies. And although the Epsteins have more recently assumed a role as consultants in preparing their loans for the exhibition, Eugene and AJ have done far more beyond their involvement with our project. Without their unflagging dedication from the 1960s to today, many of Wilfred's objects would be forever lost or destroyed, and some of those salvaged artworks have become integral to the collections that they've assembled, which are now two of the world's largest. And what follows will be a conversation about the Epstein's unparalleled experience of living with and sharing Lumia for the past several decades, and about their vision for ensuring that their own great legacy of preserving this art form will continue in the future. So please join me in welcoming to the stage Dr. Eugene E. Epstein and Mr. A.J. Epstein. Thank you. So I've talked enough. Uh, I think the rest of the program, which will run about 40 minutes, uh, will be this conversation with the Epsteins. And I've just um, come up with a series of questions that I will address to each of them. And you can decide how you would like to answer them. Um, my first question being, and Virginia touched on this a little bit in her introduction, but could you tell us a little about where and when you first saw Wilfred's work and what the immediate impact of that first encounter was? And Eugene, I'll start with you. Before responding, I'd like to take just a moment. There are three people in the audience who deserve an enormous amount of credit. Uh, first, my wife, Carol, who has encouraged me through all this uh, well, many, well, literally decades of acquiring works, and uh, without her encouragement, I'd, several of the works I don't think would be, be here. And the second two people I'd like to acknowledge are my brother and sister-in-law, who, who produced my nephew, Adam. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, and I... I'm the luckiest uncle in the world to have Adam as a partner in all, AJ as a partner in all this, and uh, Wilfred is lucky that he's involved too, yes. with the legacy of Wilfred. I, as was described earlier, I visited MoMA in 1960. I had a general interest in art, and so as I went to MoMA, um, quickly walked through, came around a corner, there was a darkened alcove, and there was Opus 137, vertical sequence number two. And within a few seconds, it just grabbed me. And I said, wow, where has this art been all my life? Found out who the artist was, wrote to him. He sent me, responded, sent back reprints of articles and so on, corresponded with him, was still in school, uh, could, know, could not afford to buy one, got out of school, got a job, wrote again, hey, when, 
he, well, I'm very busy now, and so on. In retrospect, I realized what he was busy with in the early 60s was the big Lumia suite that, he, that uh, MoMA commissioned. But after that was completed, I acquired my first work directly from Wilfred. Uh, what was uh, that? What was 1965, Opus 150. It's not in the exhibit, okay. Opus 159. But that started me. I got interested, and indirectly it started the collecting inst instinct. Uh, didn't really come on strong. I knew they were rare, wanted to know if others were around. Uh, I asked, in fact, before Wilford had one available, I asked him, are there other people who maybe want to part with theirs? And I remember him writing, uh, no, there are not. People who have them are holding on to them, knowing they will be they're exceedingly rare and they will become exceedingly value, valuable as <laughs> the art form of Lumi is uh, further recognized, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. How about you, AJ? Well, I, um, I don't have a lot of specific memories. I just know that when I was about five or six years old, my parents took me over to my uncle's house for the afternoon and the evening. And, um, uh, uh, you know, what do you do when you go to Eugene Epstein's house? No matter how old you are or who you are, you watch Lumia. <laughs> and, you know, could, I... Could you just describe the setup in, uh, of Eugene's collection in his house? Well, this was... Um, uh, Eugene and Carol did this brilliant thing. They had this, they had this nice house on this piece of property in West Los Angeles, and they took that down in the early 90s and put up this absolutely beautiful modern house. Um, that has a full Lumia gallery. Yes. But this was in the mid-70s. Okay. And so the Lumia that I remember um, was uh, on a coffee table or a side table in your front room. And so I remember, I don't remember it was the first time I saw it, but I remember having to try and close the windows and it was the middle of the day and get it dark enough to actually appreciate, you know, what is incredibly subtle. You know, a lot of light artists work in Lumia or Lumia, similar things, and a lot of them are going for really bright, big colors. But Wilfred was very often, you know, he, he, Wilfred's secret sauce was his subtlety and his complexity. And that's what, that what makes, it, makes it special. Anyways, I'm five or six years old. I see this. This is maybe a year or two before Star Wars, you know, com captured my imagination as well. But, you know, as a kid, I was playing with, um, you know, putting night lights on the end of extension cords and swinging them in circles in the, you know, I was playing with photography a little bit. Um, and uh, in hindsight, I even designed a Clavelux-like thing out of cardboard. You know, I basically had a fort that was never electrified, mom and dad, if you're in the <laughs> audience. I never, I never, I, but I was, anyways. Um, and, you know, in college, I was studying lighting design. The mm -hmm. reason I was interested in lighting design was because of my interest in Lumia, and I started working with Lumia on a large scale um, in uh, starting in college. Okay. Yeah. And can you pinpoint, in retrospect, exactly what it was that drew you into this work? For you, Eugene, for example, was it your connection to radio astronomy? Was it this uh, cosmic association? I No, not the cosmic association. Just the sheer beauty of it. It just, wow, as I said earlier, it just grabbed me. I did use, in trying to convey to others, what the experience was like, what Lumia looked like, astronomical examples. For example, can you imagine, I would say, can you imagine an artist having on her palette the shapes that appear in the aurora? Uh, and then in later years, when the Hubble Space Telescope's magnificent photos of clouds of gas and dust in our own galaxy became available, I use the same analogy, but said, can you imagine the artist having the, these images and being able to manipulate them? And so, so the astronomy reference was simply a convenience. I think it was just a gut kind of thing, uh, having nothing to do with the fact that I was studying astronomy. I think. And and AJ, for you, uh, what has continued to captivate your interest in this work beyond that initial response that you had? What is it? Well, you know, it's it's funny because I actually haven't thought about this in any detail. Um, um, so maybe this is a therapy moment. <laughs> uh, but I, I, I guess um, off the top of my head, I think 
that I'm just wired to really just be captivated by motion and color and light moving in the way that Wilfred mm -hmm. animated it. I mean, there's a couple other light artists that really grab me, um, but Wilfred, I mean, thankfully, Wilfred appeals to me in just a really primal level. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I, I like to refer to Wilfred not as an abstract artist, but as a non-objective artist. And the great thing for me conceptually is that that means you don't have to associate it with anything else. You don't have to talk about a reference to anything else. It was Wilfred making that from the ground up. Mm -hmm. and, and so that sort of allows me to um, appreciate it innocently and you know, without analysis, I guess. It just, I'm just wired to just, wow. I'll second that. Uh, just wired to respond to it right. with a while. And people who know me have experience. I'll be talking about particular work we're viewing, and I'll just interrupt my sentence when there's a particular sequence on the screen that ju I've just got to stop and watch. It just grabs me. So it's a primal. I see. So let's, let's begin to talk about your collections. And uh, could you tell us a little bit about what your initial goals were in assembling a collection and how those might have changed over time? Because Eugene, you began collecting Wilfred's work in the 1960s, and surely your objectives for the collection have changed since then. There was certainly no intent. I, I like the art, and I wanted to have more of it. But it wa I wasn't thinking in terms of a collection long term. Mm. It just happened. Uh, but it certainly was on my mind to acquire other works. I do recall reading the obituary in the New York Times in the early 1970s that Mrs. William Benton had died in mm -hmm. Connecticut. The uh, former senator from Connecticut, uh, William Benton, had owned one, and it was still in the family. I wrote to the whatever the legal department was in that town in Connecticut who administers wills and say, who is the executor of the estate for this lady? Got the name of the person, contacted and said, explained who I was, uh, because I wanted to see if I could acquire the work that he had. Big art collection, wealthy man had a large art collection. This is just one object within it and so on. And probably had gotten little attention. So, uh, But that was back in 73-ish. Uh, and about 25 years later, from one of the sons, I did acquire Opus 140, which is, so it, it, this is by way of illustrating, it sort of happened by chance. Mm -hmm. this, I think the second step, uh, the, the, the major step that started me to really more seriously think about putting together, like, in a conversation with uh, Wilford's son, Tom, in early 90s, uh, I had asked him, hey, I wonder whatever happened to the work by, I don't know which one we're referring to. Uh, and he said, well, I don't know. And they said, you know, someone really ought to try to track all of these works down now before people die and they aren't functioning and get tossed and so on and so on. And that really was a big push for me to contact people that led me, for example, to call up someone whom I had met in the mid-60s because he had a work uh, and I kept in touch with him maybe once a decade, called him up, happened to be former Congressman Frederick Richmond from uh, New York, uh, Manhattan, and I said, Mitch Church, this is Eugene, do you still have that Lumia work? And he said, yes, and I'm trying to get rid of it. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he was getting along in years and so on. And that caught me completely off guard because that's not the reason I called. I just wanted to verify that he still had his own. But I realized, hey, I've got to think quick. And anyway, within several weeks, we made a, uh, an agreement, and I acquired that work. Okay. And put that step, and eventually just luck, too. OK. AJ, can you talk a little bit about your collection, how it relates to Eugene's, what your sort of collecting relationship is, and what your hopes are for your collection in the future? Yeah. The, um you know, it wasn't until almost uh, almost about 20 years ago that I really understood uh, owning a Wilfred in terms of a legacy, um, you know, with Wilfred's legacy, but also the family legacy. 
or you know, the Wilford family legacy and the Epstein family legacy. Um, but my actually my first Lumia was a gift from Eugene in probably 1990 or 1991. It was actually, it wasn't a Wilfred, it was by an artist named Dick Land who is still alive and kicking up at MIT or Harvard? He was the Harvard research for many years. He gotcha. Um, and, and Dick had built a light box. He didn't call it a Lumia, he called it a Land Cromara or a Cromera. Um, and it needed a little bit of work, um, so that was the first Lumia I ever owned and repaired, okay. um, and I still have it in my basement. I actually, I got it out last year hoping to be able to spend some time fixing it up and getting it going again, but I, I unfortunately didn't have the time. But um, then, uh, uh, let's see, and then in 2001, Eugene loaned me uh, Clevelix Jr. number 95, Stokowski. the Stokowski piece. It was uh, it was very similar to the piece that's in Unit 86, which is in this show. Um, it, which is on the screen right now. This is the Clevelix Jr., which is um, a series of 16 almost identical objects that Wilfred made in 1930. There's 10 of them. He made 16 of them. There's 10 of them extant, and the Epsteins have seven of them. Um, <laughs> Um, and uh, so Eugene loaned me uh, the Stokowski piece, Leopold Stokowski, who is, uh, was uh, the conductor of the Philadelphia Symphony in the 20s and 30s and a major proponent of the synesthetic arts. And if you've seen the movie Fantasia, he's the conductor in silhouette introducing all the pieces. Um, so there is, even if indirect and not, um, not absolutely direct, there is lineage in there from, um, you know. Uh, excuse me for interrupting. I want to note that in the 1920s, I think 1926, uh, Wilfred and Stokowski experimented with the uh, Philadelphia Orchestra with a simultaneous performance of Wilfred on the Clavelux and playing, uh, which were great, Scheherazade. Uh, and uh, I think one or two performances in Philadelphia, one of them, and it was written up. I talked years later, meaning late 60s, to Stokowski's ex-wife, who is still alive, and had introduced Stokowski to Wilfred's Light Art. She was very avant-garde in New York. And she said, well, quite frankly, neither Wilfred nor my husband really felt that, this wor that it worked. Hmm. They weren't happy with it, so it was right. not pursued. Wilfred was more comfortable with his work being appreciated silently um, and on its own. So let's let's talk a little bit about the Clavelux. Speaking of his performances from the 1920s, and if I can find um, the slide showing him at his Clavelux, there you go. Um, so, as I mentioned in my remarks, the clavelux uh, was the instrument that Wilfred used beginning in the 1920s to give these live Lumia performances before uh, audiences in concert halls. And this is a practice that he continued throughout the 1930s and most of the 1940s. So it constituted a major aspect of his practice. Uh, but as I said, most of uh, all of the claveluxes um, have are no longer extant, and they only survive in these disassembled parts. But the Epsteins own those disassembled parts, so theoretically, a clavelux could be replicated. And I'm I'm just wondering, what would it take to replicate a clavelux so that it could be played once again, based on your assessment? Um, and is this even uh, an ambition of yours? Well, I have uh, founded, a, 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 I have a foundation that I run that I'm the executive director of that is dedicated towards, <laughs> called clavelix.org, um, that is dedicated towards hopefully someday the, the, uh, the end result being a, not just the preservation of Wilfred, but a functional clavelux. We do have, um, we have three things in uh, that's, uh, Basically, I converted my basement into a Wilfred storage unit, most of which is stored in acid-free boxes and inventory and everything. But we have um, mostly intact 
is the Model E Clavelux from 1924, which is which is this instrument. Um, it's uh, two of the four modules are missing things. Two of, but the other two modules are actually mostly intact, and we think we could probably have them working in probably just a matter of weeks. The problem is, you know, they're almost a hundred years old and they're fragile. So the idea of spending all of this effort and money fixing them up only to have them probably break or you know, brittle parts come apart again, it just doesn't make any sense. So what our vision is, is to replicate them. And over the years, we've talked to uh, a few engineers um, and you know, tried to find people that would be interested. And we found a few people that could do it. Um, we feel that the cost of doing so, and we've actually had a couple estimates, it's, it's north of $300,000. Mm. So if anyone in the audience wants a Clavelux, you know, come talk to us. We'd love to. We'd love to help you to, to have partners in this. Uh, and I should uh, point out, we have spent um, collectively uh, a number of weeks diagramming the schematic drawings of how it's put together mechanically and electrically. So we know pretty much how it works, uh, but it just will be a lot of work by a dedicated individual. We have at least one person in mind who's chomping at the bit to do it out of uh, interest and has the skills to do it. Uh, but there's a little matter of some funding. We have a guesstimate of maybe it's a year's worth of work on the part of one person. The right person, the right person. So that's the Model E. We also have somewhat intact the Model G Clavelux, um, uh, which unfortunately has too much asbestos in it probably for anyone to, to ever touch it again. It's encased and, um, you know, the open to uh, the proper institution taking it and, and doing it. But we also have, m this is where the mostly disassembled stuff comes in, mm -hmm. is that um, you know, he had his theater, the Art Institute of Light, which had a much more complicated Clavelux system than his touring models. And um, what we believe are the mostly disassembled projectors from the, that theater in Grand Central Palace. Mm -hmm. And some of them, there's some components are relatively intact and we can look at photos of the projection room from the Art Institute of Light and I can say, oh yeah, that's this piece. And there's a few pieces like that and then there's just a lot of mystery projector parts. I mean, it probably is, if not um, a doctoral thesis, you know, or dissertation, <laughs> right. you know, in figuring this out and putting it back together, it's certainly a master's thesis okay. in doing o it. On the other hand, a lot of just odds and ends mm -hmm. from right other works he had done and long since disassembled. He was big on cannibalizing stuff. So we often wonder, we look at like uh, Opus 162 Lucata, which is his last piece from 1968, and just wonder, well occasionally, or 161 we were talking about, it's like, is this part something that he put together specifically for, that he machined specifically for this instrument? Or is it something that's been sitting around in a, you know, in a crate for decades that he finally repurposed? Right. One of the things that I wanted to emphasize in my introductory remarks was Wilfred's reuse of the same basic parts in almost all of his machines. So I mentioned the incandescent light bulbs uh, of which you have uh, stocks of, of the, type, the types that he used, uh, a color element which would be rotating inside the mechanism, and also these reflective surfaces which create all of the forms on the screen. So because Wilfred was reusing the same basic materials again and again, uh, that is why he came to, as AJ says, cannibalize his own parts and reuse them I, in several I've got to interject, machines. don't forget the history. He was in the 1920s, but then the de depression hit in 1929, early 30s. So just as a matter of necessity, he had to be very frugal throughout the 30s. He was raising a family, so, so it'd be natural to reuse. Right. Do, does either of you know what happened to the other Clavelux models? I mentioned that Wilfred made eight. The, uh, he gradually disassembled them. His first one, the, where he gave uh, his first live public performance in 1922 at the Neighborhood Playhouse in uh, Manhattan, uh, that was a really big kludgy thing, maybe well, at least as long as this carpet here, and maybe even longer. There are pictures of it. Uh, and he d realized, hey, this is not very transportable. I've made a Model B and C, it gradually improved. 
finally settled on this one, which is transportable in about uh, four crates for each of the four modules, plus another couple of crates for accessory materials and so on. But even then, it's a lot of work. Right. But the other things, uh, he just realized he was not going to use them when he had this one okay. to work with. And so, canalized for parts and his, the last Clavelux that he built, the Model H, which is what he referred to as a demonstration unit, and it really was sort of a Clavelux in a suitcase kind of thing. So it, was, it had a number of parameters that it wasn't as complicated in this, and he used it when he gave lectures. And there's, uh, I met a few years ago in the Bay Area an artist named Roger Ferragallo, um, who had been a, a student at the Art Institute of Chicago in 51, I think, and he saw a, a lecture of Wilfred where he um, gave the demonstration with the Model H. Mm -hmm. And I suspect there are components of the Model H in my basement. Um, I haven't been able to positively identify them, but, um, and there's not many, if any, photos, but there is a drawing of him giving a demonstration, and that drawing was the basis for the backside of the metal in in the exhibit, there's a case with a metal that um, Wilfred Sonnen had struck, and that's got Wilfred having light emanating from a device, and that's the Model H Clavelux. Okay, so we should be optimistic that perhaps one day the Clavelux could be replicated, but I won't hold my breath uh, for it to happen immediately. So let's let's circle back to the exhibition and some of the work that you've lent to it. Um, and out of curiosity, I'm wondering if the exhibition or its accompanying catalog have led you to think differently about Wilfred's work, given the presentation and, um, and the labels. Um, also, if not, <laughs> if, if it hasn't changed your thinking, um, what other aspects of Lumia do you think are, have yet to be explored? What is there left to say about Wilfred? Yeah. I, I can't answer the last question. I'm sure AJ can. The, it's nice to read the, uh, the material in the catalog, but as we've said a number of times, it's the experience of the art that's just a gut level, primal, ineffable experience. Uh, so I can't say that the catalog changed my appreciation or the exhibit. I still marvel at this work, mm. and uh, it's our favorite. And uh, uh, the but what further view? I I'm nonplussed. How about you? Um, well, uh, you know, for i'm going to talk I'm going to talk about Wilfred and his legacy a little bit more, and I might ask you to re-ask the question in a second so I can make sure I'm giving you a complete answer. But you know, for myself a couple decades and for Eugene a number of a few decades more, you know, we've been saying, Thomas Wilfred, he's important. No, no, he's important. Isn't this beautiful? Isn't this the most beautiful thing you've ever seen? And you know, most people are like, oh wow, yeah, that's great. That's great. That's great. Oh, yeah, yeah, Wilfred's important. And you know, we show up at Yale and and, you know, all of a sudden Yale's like, Wilford's important. Oh my, yeah, Wilford's important. And so the, the absolute bedrock thing about that, that um, I get from this exhibit is this affirmation of all of our work that, you know, damn it, yes, Wilford's important. And we didn't have to do any work with you guys. You guys got it and you have brought this forth and it's... Um, you know, this, this thing that we've dedicated our life to about saying, you know, we need to preserve this legacy because this guy's important. And, um, you know, the fact that we didn't have to twist your arm, we didn't have to make, we didn't have to endow anything or make any donations, you guys just said, yeah, and ran with it. So, um, so that's what we've gotten, that's what I get the most out of this exhibit is this relief that, you know, we're not just working alone now that you know, mm -hmm. we have seeded this into the world and, and people are really appreciating it and, and picking up the mantle of preserving him. And that's, that's a huge relief. I'll add to that. Uh, the only other major Wilford exhibition was in 1971 at the Lake Corcoran Gallery. And I spent a week in Washington, D.C. 
uh, took vacation time, figuring, hey, it's unlikely that during my lifetime I'll have a chance to see all of these works together. So I spent a week then. Well, 46 of the years later, thanks to Keeley and, and Jason and uh, colleagues and so on, uh, I've had two opportunities in my lifetime to see the whole assemblage and experience what AJ just said about, hey, Wilford really is important and these people get it and others will be able to see it. So I have one final question for you before we open up uh, the questions to the audience. And that is of all at the 15 works assembled in the exhibition, and it doesn't necess necessarily need to be one owned by you, but what work uh, remains the most meaningful to you, and can you tell us why? I, I'm stuck on the word meaningful, so I'll ignore it. Okay. Uh, the, <laughs> good, good. Uh, because uh, as I say, it's a visceral right. experience, and so right. and. Uh, the Lumia Suite is the extant masterpiece, so to speak, but in some ways it's a tour de force. In terms of his pure elemental Lumia, where it's just a light bulb and reflecting surfaces, this work is still my favorite, I th and I think his finest work. And there's some uh, a technical reason why AJ and I think that. Uh, uh, but I still will wow, stop myself and conversate at some of the other works. Mm. I can't really say anything more, more, anything profound. That's fine. I knew you would pick this one. <laughs> and, and just a side note, this is Opus 161, uh, Untitled. Um, from 1965-66, and the interesting th thing about it is we think it's actually unfinished. We think Wilfred was mostly done with it, but he probably wanted to, as he said, tune it a little bit more before he put it up for sale, because he normally Wilfred would send a letter to um, collectors, people that had shown interest, saying, you know, I now have one for sale if you're interested, um, and he never did that with, with 161. It was, um, it was in his... Uh, in his in his studio when, when he died. Um, uh, as far as my favorite, no, I can't. I, I I really can't. There are moments of appreciation that I have for each work, and you know, Lucata is. I have been in um, a, a maintenance relationship with Lucata for the past decade. I'll it's, show you Lucata. <laughs> um, it's his, it's his final work from um, 1968. He finished it three months before it, he died. It's the only piece he ever sold through a gallery, the Howard Weiss Gallery in, um, in New York. And, um, and it's, it's pretty complicated. It's in many ways a mini version of Lumia Suite. And it's finicky. And uh, for more than the past decade, you know, every time we loan it to a museum, it needs it needs a lot of assistance and and um, thankfully I haven't been alone recently. Jason DeBlock is often you know we've had some serious head scratchers with this guy the yes. last couple times we've shown it and Jason's been just invaluable in helping figure out you know how to make it work. Um, it's working beautifully. It has been all day and I expect it to continue <laughs> throughout the rest of the show. Um, so, I, but I do want to say just from my experience as, as an art appreciator is they're all beautiful. I remember the first time I met um, uh, um, uh, Counterpoint in Space, the Metropolitan Museum of Art piece. Mm -hmm. And I have to say, I wasn't really impressed with it. You know, I saw it and I was like, yeah, that's pretty, it's a Lumia, but it just seemed like it was another iteration of that. And so when it, in February, when the show opened at Yale, I didn't spend a lot of time with it. Um, and I really made a point when the show closed at Yale in July to just say, okay, I'm gonna just, this last day of the show, I'm gonna spend time with this work and just appreciate it. And probably about a half an hour before the show finished, I just was sitting there in awe of it because I was being surprised and I was getting things that I had never appreciated out of it and it, it, it was subtle and powerful and beautiful. And just to be able to have sort of the completeness of every work you know, now that I've experienced is, is powerful to me. Mm. Um, and no, I can't choose a favorite. Fair enough. <laughs> well, thank you so much for sharing those stories with us. And 
Are there any questions in the audience? There are microphones for you. So, you know, the last uh, discussion really kind of was something I was thinking of is, okay, you've got an exhibit, it's going on in Washington, D.C., and a light bulb burns out, a motor burns out. How, how, what, it, what is the contingency plan to keep this up and operational during, during the exhibit? Can I feel this one? Uh, the AJ and our philosophy is, hey, we want to have uh, posterity's worth of spare parts. <laughs> and so we bought, what was it, 225 of the motors? Uh, yeah, we've got a couple hundred motors and a few thousand light bulbs of various types. <laughs> but nonetheless, sometimes the, the equipment in there is handmade or specialized, and we either have to try to fix it or have a new one made. And Jason DeBlock has helped in that sort of thing. We're, we're very lucky, at least in the, the one motor type that he used most commonly made, uh, it's a Synchron motor made by the Hanson Motor Company of Princeton, Indiana. They still make that motor. Um, and, uh, and you can order one for about 25 bucks. And yeah, we have a couple hundred of them just in case they stop making them. Um, <laughs> Most of the light bulbs that Wilfred, light bulb types he used, they've stopped making them. We were paying pretty close attention to um, supplies, and when we knew that they had stopped making or were about to stop making some, we started hoarding. So we literally do have spread between my three, um, my home, my, my warehouse, and my studio in Seattle, and um, Eugene's house in Los Angeles. We have several thousand light bulbs of various types. Uh, to answer your question about the plan um, for maintenance during the exhibition. Luckily, these works have been tested at the Yale Art Gallery in, this, in the spring, and we, we learned that there will be issues that arise. Um, sometimes it's uh, on a weekly basis, sometimes it's on a daily basis. Uh, but what we, what we also learned is uh, a lot of information about how each of the work, works functions. So we have, we have this great team, uh, Jason DeBlock's name has been mentioned, um, and as well as Carol Snow, our objects conservator at Yale, and they have assembled a maintenance manual that we've given to the Smithsonian, and luckily um, Dan Finn, who is the time-based media conservator here, has, is in possession of that manual and has come to know our team, um, and we feel pretty confident that they can address these issues. And, and we're always question. available by Skype and telephone and email. <laughs> my, my final question is, how do these replacement parts affect what is considered the historical integrity of the, the pieces? I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't quite understand the second half. Of well, in terms of you've got to replace a motor, you've got to rewire it, all of these things, how do these changes to make it functional affect the historic integrity of the object? The intent is not to do anything to change Wilford's original composition. So we're using the same motor he used. If we have to replace wiring, that's all we're doing, replacing wiring. We are not changing how the instrument functions. We're very careful about anything we do. Hey, we do not want that change if we have to make a new part. Is that going to make the resulting composition on the screen different? We are very conscious of not to not do that. We, um, we, we do mark, new, like when we put in a new motor, even if it's, and, and Wilford himself changed light bulbs and motors, you know, all the time and replaced color wheels when they faded or, or cracked. So, um, and we do, when we put in a new motor, we try and mark it. If we have to replace a color wheel or something, we, we mark it. Um, we do talk, you know, sometimes we have to get a new part machined and we, we get it precisely, you know, to match um, what, what the original was, but we, we are, Always, our most common conversation about Wilfred is, you know, making sure that, you know, because he himself, I like to use the term outsider engineer, um, you know, so he was known for his Rube Goldberg-like mechanical compositions, um, and uh, you know, his his strengths and weaknesses as an engineer are part of the story. So we work really hard to make sure that, you know, that part of the story is preserved, and we're not changing it.
Hi. Uh, so you've mentioned that these objects can be a little finicky and, and hard to maintain. And um, so in terms of preserving this for posterity, um, is there any thought to trying to do some type of uh, video documentation? I mean, you've got a catalog, which is a series of still images for time-based media. Wouldn't, wouldn't it make sense to maybe do something along the lines of video documentation, just even for preservation purposes? We have, we do. Um, I, um, uh, this show specifically w presented an unheard of before now, or be in my lifetime, opportunity to have 15 of them in the same room that was filmable. So we got permissions for all the, all the other institutions um, and have recorded them all. And, um, and I expect, and that's with the best camera that I can afford <laughs> today. Um, and I expect in a few years, you know, I'll wanna somehow get them all in the same room or, you know, travel around and do it. But I've been traveling the country filming Lumia with, you know, the best camera I could bring forth with, you know, with my budget for over a decade now. So we have, um, I think, a good archive that is representative. And we have even, and, um, Several times we've sent video of a piece onto a show. We had a, a, a show in um, uh, Iceland, in Reykjavik a few years ago, and then in uh, Toronto just last year mm -hmm. that had video, not a piece. Uh, I should also mention that the Yale Art Gallery uh, created video documentation of every work in the exhibition, and that's available on our YouTube channel and noted in the exhibition introductory texts in the exhibition. Um, so those videos are, I would say, maybe not a slightly lesser quality than AJ's, but what we have also done is include an image of the object that produces the composition so that you see that reference to the actual sculptural three-dimensional object as well as the video that follows, and ours are 10 minutes. One thing to note is Wilfred didn't want Lumia to be filmed. Um, he felt that 24 frames a second didn't capture it, and obviously in his lifetime there wasn't a film stock that was um, sensitive enough to really capture the, the sensitivity to it of it. And when we do refer to the, U, the stuff that is YouTube or anywhere else, uh, we make it clear this is only a representation that you're seeing digitally is only a representation to give you a feel of what the in-person experience of viewing these analog objects are like. Hi. Um, in the exhibition, I was really struck in the last room, there is um, a couple of photos of dance performances with the Lumia in the background. And I was curious about that process and the choreography and what that would have been like that experience for the viewers. Can you talk a little bit about that? You said about the dance. Yeah, yeah. dance yeah. performances, how yeah. they use the Lumia as kind of like as inspiration or how did that, um, and do they have a set choreographer that they worked with? Um, I'm just curious because um, as Kaylee said a little while ago, he preferred them to be silent. Um, and then that's a completely different interpretation of using the movement um, with the light. He was flexible about using music on occasion and he did experiment with dance, but we don't know, none of us ever seen one of those performances. And there's no film of it. There's a few still photos which you've seen. We don't know what the experience was like, how well it turned out. There is a, a, a contemporary light artist who passed away just a couple of years ago, Chris Sidenius, who had a Lumia theater uh, as he, he built uh, directly out of his inspiration from Wilfred's work, and he maintained in Sandy Hook, Connecticut. And often when he gave these Lumia performances in his theater, he had dancers who would perform in front of the screen. Um, I, my understanding is that they were performing modern dance and um, interpreting the work, uh, the light behind them as they were moving. It was all improvisational, essentially. Do we know what the score was? Or do we know who the um, choreographer was? 
it, 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 there might be, there's, there's 27 boxes of his records it, in the Yale archives, um, in manuscripts and archives. That information might be in there. There might be some correspondence or letters in there, but it's actually something we don't know. We, I've just been assuming they were silent, and I've been assuming, I, I would suspect, based on what we know about Wilfred the, um, and how he promoted himself, was that was those photos of featuring the dancers was something he was trying on to generate interest, and it may not have generated the interest he wanted, so he didn't, he didn't pursue that avenue for very much longer. I like diagrams, and I wonder if you would go back to that diagram where he, he had, on the left there's the light, the boxes, the ref, and on the screen, and then on the right um, is the operator. This? No, it's a diagram, that one. This one, yes. okay. So I'm, I'm not quite understanding how he's work he's working the clavalox is that correct and Cor correct so somehow he's connected to i mean it's not like the furniture is oh okay. yeah. uh, the the projection equipment the lighting equipment the instrument is there on the left what he calls a projection room and uh, a translucent screen the audience sitting in chairs here and Wilford or someone performing the controls for these instruments are back here. In fact, at the very top, it says duct for electrical and mechanical controls between instruments, the instruments there, and the keyboard. And, and the people sitting in the audience in the chairs were unaware supposedly unaware, did, didn't need to be aware that there is a person back there controlling all these instruments. I, I hope that answers. And imagine, imagine that Wilfred has condensed all of these components of his clavolux into the small scale works that you see in the exhibition. He's just taken those elements and brought them um, into fully automatic pre-programmed instruments. And we can actually continue the questions upstairs. So let, sure. this will be our last question. Okay. Thank you. I have to ask this question. I mean, you talked about him being Danish. He came from Denmark or Europe, doing his studies here. <clears throat> Has he ever talked about, or can you see a Nordic Danish influence uh, in the work he's done? What kind of influence? A Nordic, Danish inspiration or interest or? Well, there was the Vikings. <laughs> he had in, um, in the 20s, um, it's, it's, a, it's a bit of a curiosity. He, uh, it was at the Goodman Theater and then it was on Broadway. He did the projected scenery and lighting um, for a production of Ibsen's The Vikings. And, um, and he may have also done a translation of it. Um, and uh, the, what's interesting to me is that the playbill for the Broadway production also lists him as the director of the show. Um, but I haven't ever found any backup as to why he is listed as the director and not just the lighting effect, in effects guy. Um, I, I, I personally do not know enough about the human experience, but I will say to the extent that uh, my perception is Nordic, Scandinavian, uh, quiet, reserved, because Wilfred certainly was a quiet, reserved individual. I knew him a little bit, met him a few times, talked to him over the phone a number of times, corresponded with him quite a bit. Uh, but I would like to take the opportunity, you as the ambassador of Denmark, th thank you for coming, for having, thank Denmark for having created this person who created this marvelous art. Thank you. Well, 
Thank you. Thank we you. actually have one more thing to say. Is um, um, Wilfred's, when Wilfred died, Wilfred's son, who was uh, um, uh, for a time the chair of the Newsmismatic News Society of New York, had a medal struck to honor his father. And on at least one occasion, although probably more, he publicly awarded this medal to somebody who furthered not just Wilfred's Lumia, but light art in general. And I want to say for nine years, a better part of a decade of just thankless dedication to this hobby of ours and making, making this thing real is we would like to award you, Dr. Keeley Orgman, with a Thomas Wilfred medal. <laughs> With that, we invite you to join us and we can continue the conversation in the courtyard where we'll have a reception. Thank you for coming. We're, we're happy to so, keep answering your questions too. So Absolutely. Have, have Thank you. Thank you all.